You may want to listen to this. It's all Greek tracker stuff. I mean, I want largely to see how these guys are doing their presentations. Do you know him? What? Hello? Hello? Hi, are you, are you joining us for the panelist? Oh, yeah. You know what? I'm on to see how everyone's doing their presentations. Um, oh. Dimitri, I think we met years and years ago. I don't know if you remember. Hi, Dylan. It's a, it's Elizabeth Perdromo. I'm speaking on Friday, um, and I uh, parachuted in this morning, and it was fantastic. Thank so, you. I don't know. Am I, am I not supposed to be on this? This is the link that Petro sent to me, so am I in the wrong... Please. Listen, you know, if he sent it to you, he sent it to you. Um, I just know I'm hosting. I mean, you're more than welcome to stay, but we'll I'll be the one that's organizing it. But yeah, I don't no, know. no. If I'm if I'm supposed to be um, logging on in another way, just tell me and I will follow your instructions. This is the only link that I had. So um, yeah, I think there might be a way to make you an attendee. So okay, me... Dimitri, I look forward to hearing you. Hi Elizabeth, thanks so much. thanks so much. Are you in Are you in Athens right now? No, I'm in Turkey still. Oh, okay. Uh, are you in Istanbul? Uh, in Ankara. Oh, in Ankara. Okay. Yeah. The, the less fun part of Turkey, I have to say. <laughs> Although maybe maybe it's fun. I don't know. I don't know. So. It's not. Believe yeah. me, it's not. <laughs> yeah. You guys were just shut down right the other day for the national entrance exams. Right. Yeah. 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 All kinds is happening, all kinds. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing we have in common right now is the two lunatics running each country. So <laughs> since this is since this is off the off the live part, I'll just express right. my um, I, yeah, I hope you do it yeah. it, if you don't mind. Okay. You wanna you wanna boot me out? Tell me how to um, how to get on another way, and I'll follow your instructions. Oh, no, I can do that from my end. Okay. So I, think I can do it here. One second. There we go.
All right, everyone, welcome to today's lecture. My name is Dylan. I would like to welcome you all to the Summer 2020 Eastern Mediterranean Security Conference. Emanuel College, an institute of Eastern Mediterranean Studies since 2012, has been organizing a four-week Eastern Mediterranean Security Studies program for students and young academics interested in the interaction of democracy, energy, geopolitics, and security in the region. This competitive program has allowed students and participants to study and experience firsthand the importance of the region that has been a cultural, economic, and geopolitical vortex since antiquity. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic is yet another conditionality that has altered the dimensions of security and complexity of the area. Since travel in the region is prohibited this summer, IEMS is in cooperation with the Constantine G. Karamanlis Chair in Hellenic and European Studies and the Institute of International Relations will be hosting a one-week program of focused lectures, presentations, and panel discussions. The one-week program will bring experts from the region in two sets of lectures aimed at assessing democracy, energy, and geopolitics in the role of leadership, diplomacy, and statecraft in this changing environment of the Eastern Mediterranean. Our presenters this week will come from different countries of the region as well as backgrounds. We have a mixture of policymakers, diplomats, and academics. The full program is available once you register for the conference. I am honored to introduce you all to Dr. Dimitri Sarujas. Dr. Sarujas is an associate professor at the Department of International Relations at Bill Kent University in Turkey and visiting researcher at the BMW Center the Walsh School of Foreign Service in Georgetown University. He has taught at the Middle East Technical University in Turkey and has been a research fellow at Queen Mary University of London and a Jean Monnet Chair in EU Politics from 2012 to 2015. Dr. Sarujas is an editor in multiple foreign policy journals and a member to numerous academic organizations. Dr. Sarujas specializes in European politics his latest book, co-edited with Owen Parker, is entitled Crisis in the Eurozone Periphery. His research seeks to transcend disciplinary divides to incorporate insights from IR, comparative politics, and political economy. He is the author of numerous articles on European politics, comparative politics, political economy, and Greek-Turkish relationships, which we will talk about today. So the way this is gonna work is I will ask you all to turn off your microphones. Um, I'll be handing it over to our speaker in just a moment. So this will work over an hour and a half time frame. The first hour will be given to the presentation and the last minute, 30 minutes will be given to Q&A. Feel free though, over the course of the lecture, if you have any questions to drop them in the question and answer bo box, and we'll go over those later. So thank you all very, very much. And I hope we have a wonderful productive presentation and discussion. Alrighty, so I'll be now handing it over to our friend, Dr. Dimitri Sarujas. One moment. All right. And, um, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you also to uh, Professor Barbacas for his um, kind invitation to be here today and to um, share some thoughts on the subject of uh, Greek-Turkish relations. Uh, what I will be uh, talking about is uh, the transformation of this relationship. Um, and I will try to be succinct. I'll try not to spend the entire 60 minutes so that we can have as much interaction following the presentation um, as possible. Uh, what I would like to do is um, share the presentation. Um, I'm not sure whether that's possible, Dylan, or um, should we? One moment. I can just proceed without sharing it. Give was... me one second. Sure. Do you have the presentation? Um, you can send it to me and I can download and we can perhaps share it on my screen and I can go through there, okay? Okay, sure, sure. Um, just, um, let me see. 
how should I send it to you? One moment. Do you want to try that one more time? I've now given you the spotlight video. Okay. Right, I think it's possible now. Is it Excellent. Two? All right, brilliant. Okay, very good. So let's take it from there. Um, let me just uh, say a few words to start with um, in terms of how I have sort of designed uh, this lecture for you today. Uh, so I will try to begin with a bit of, a, of an overview uh, of how the relationship has been shaped through time, uh, starting from 1945, starting from the Cold War context. And what I will try to stress is, in essence, the sort of two different phases that I have identified in terms of how Greece and Turkey related to one another during that time, starting with a more classical, if you want, the more uh, security-oriented uh, relationship which had emerged uh, at the time when the Cold War began, and then moving on to the second phase, which begins towards the end of the Cold War in what I call the liberal moment, that is to say, the moment when uh, the understanding was ripe that a kind of liberal internationalism was spreading across the world, and it could also influence the kind of hot um, bilateral relationships between countries uh, such as Greece and Turkey in a way that would lead to a normalization of their relationship. Um, what I think is very significant, uh, not least because of the context in which we are uh, meeting online this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are in the world, is at the same time the global transformation that has been, that has been occurring. And I say this because um, it is impossible to see this relationship between Greece and Turkey if you remove it from the context of global politics. And I think many of us share the assumption that something deep and transformative is happening in the way that this is actually occurring. And I will try to illustrate how this is affecting the relationship um, and also place it in the context, of course, of the massive uh, change currently uh, happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, the um, possibility of exploring hydrocarbons in the region, and the way in which what used to be, and I guess that's one of the main arguments of today's lecture, what used to be a straight bilateral relationship has changed quite dramatically. First, as I will argue with regard to um, the role of the United States in the region. Secondly, with regard to the role that the European Union played or plays, question mark there, particularly with regard to Turkey, Greece being a new member. Uh, and finally, of course, how the new constellation of power in the Eastern Mediterranean is offering new opportunities for cooperation, but it also offers a lot of space for new conflicts, especially if one considers um, the way in which domestic politics has been transformed, particularly in the case of Turkey. So I guess one of the, one of the main arguments I would wish to defend uh, in this lecture is how the interplay between domestic political constellations has had a direct effect on foreign policy behavior. And it is for that reason why the potential for conflict is actually quite high uh, in the region as a whole, but also especially, of course, with regard to how Greece and Turkey relate uh, to one another. So if I want to start uh, with what I call the past number one, that is to say the Cold War context, and if we want to discuss where Greece and Turkey were at the time, uh, particularly if you come from a more uh, realist school of thinking in international relations, you could fairly easily describe how Greece and Turkey related to one another through the prism of a cold peace or a frozen conflict. At any rate, a situation in which the two nations had important outstanding differences, uh, differences which persist to this day, uh, not least to delineating their precise uh, maritime borders, not least in terms of 
uh, delineating precisely the airspace which they uh, which belongs to each of the two sides. Now, one of the reasons why Greece and Turkey during that time be placed in the in the box, if you wish, of the frozen conflicts is precisely because if you follow a slightly more constructivist understanding of IR, you have a classic case of othering in terms of uh, identity formation. That is to say, Greece, a uh, country which of course emerges from uh, the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, Turkey, a republic which emerges following the destruction and dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, in many important respects, see each other through the same mirror. Um, the process of state formation is very much related to the way in which they see each other. Uh, and that is especially the case of Greece, of course, which emerges as the first country uh, of, the, of the Ottoman uh, domain, which uh, seeks to claim and successfully claims independence from uh, the Ottoman state. And of course, Turkey in the early 20th century uh, moves through a process of its own war of independence and emerges as a new republic. So this is a, a period of time let's say from the 1920s, at which point Turkey emerges as a state of high politics. That is to say, you have a relationship between the two nations, which remains pretty peaceful and under the watchful eye of the Cold War context, and in particular the United States, and remains pretty stable all the way uh, until the 1970s, give or take important skirmishes uh, between them, but also, of course, the, the key uh, issue that still um, uh, constitutes a major hindrance is the improvement of relations, namely Cyprus. My main point, from a more methodological point of view, is that during that period of time, in essence, you have the absence of what you would call track to diplomacy. Right? So relations between Greece and Turkey are always very formalized. They are always very... Um, Diplomatic with a large, with a, with a capital D, that is to say, they take place between state representatives uh, in different fora, uh, and they actually tend to be quite few and far between. You have very little civil society interaction, you have minimal, if not zero, uh, economic relations between the two nations, and all of this is happening during the context of the Cold War, uh, during which time both Greece and Turkey, going all the way back to the Truman Doctrine, are absolutely paramount to what the alliance, in particular the United States, um, defines as its vital national security interest in its confrontation with the Soviet Union. So the Cold War, therefore, is key in shaping this relationship, particularly with regard to the participation of both NATO's, uh, both countries in NATO, in the North Atlantic, uh, treaty organization starting from the mid 1950s, and that in a way allows for the frozen conflict element that I talked about before, right? So, placing their conflict on ice uh, essentially until the eruption of the Cyprus problem, which of course would lead quickly to a deterioration of bilateral relations with both Greece and then later on Turkey as well, seeing in Cyprus vital national foreign policy issues at stake. Um, the role of the United States here is significant in the sense that for a prolonged period of time, and as we will see later on, during the 1990s as well, during the liberal moment as well, uh, the US will exercise the role of a mediator in seeking to avert a, a hot military conflict between the two countries when they came close uh, to that eventuality, but also, of course, as guaranteeing the uh, upholding of the anti-communist doctrine uh, in the domestic politics of both countries, and of course, with regard to their foreign policy orientation. So in that sense, what you have is a very significant twin role of the US in making sure that on the one hand, you have the, the averting of a conflict that would run directly counter to its interests in the region during the Cold War, and of course, at the same time, it would allow it to mediate in a, in a way that would upgrade its own uh, position in the region, something which, of course, uh, the US has been able to do quite successfully 
uh, and for quite a length of time. Now, uh, in what I consider the past for the purposes of this lecture, we also have the transition to a slightly different phase uh, at the end of the Cold War, and in particular during the 1990s and the early uh, 2000s. The end of the Cold War will be accompanied by a lot of um, writing and so-called analysis about the possibility of moving on to a liberal moment. If it wasn't exactly a type of Wilsonian idealist moment, it was certainly a moment in which the triumph of liberal values, of liberal democracy and uh, global capitalism was meant to usher in a new era, an era in which uh, the role of states would be now supplemented by the role of private corporations, NGOs, and civil society activism, a world in which new types of cooperation and certainly economic interdependence would define international relations between states. And it's interesting, I think, to observe the way in which this particular liberal moment actually appears to have had a certain effect on the Greek-Turkish relationship. Um, one very important variable in this is um, Europeanization. Now, Greece becomes a member of the then community in the early 1980s. And if you follow the um, more sociological accounts of the effect that this has uh, during membership, that is to say, the way in which member states of the European community change their forest foreign policy behavior as a result of um, their uh, membership there, you can start seeing some of the contours of how the relationship between Greece and Turkey changed. So in essence, in the 1990s, uh, Greece opted for the so-called Europeanization of its foreign policy orientation. Uh, and this has bearings on how it relates to Turkey as well. So regardless of the party in office, Greece uh, adopts the foreign policy dogma, if you like, that the bilateral relationship, perhaps better said the bilateral conflict with Turkey, should actually be read in the context of the country's EU membership. That is to say, Greece should try to Europeanize uh, bilateral or what used to be bilateral disputes with Turkey as a result of its membership. Now, the reason why this particular foreign policy orientation appeared to be bearing some fruit was uh, the fact that Turkey was actually willing to play along in the sense that its own foreign policy preferences at the time, during the end of the Cold War, and at the time in which its economic relationship with the West and the EU in particular was getting enhanced, was precisely to seek European Union membership as well. And that is also the, the period of time during which Turkey will actually actively uh, try to uh, engage with a set of political and economic reforms that the European Union would prescribe and would potentially allow it membership down the road. Now, we know today this never happened, but of course, no one knew it at the time. And of course, for Greece to see the Europeanization of its conflict with Turkey made a lot of political sense, not least because the idea was there that if Turkey wishes to become an EU member, it will have to actually adopt a more conciliatory stance vis-a-vis -vis Greece and with reference to the outstanding bilateral issues that the two countries uh, had. The membership of the Republic of Cyprus into the European Union strengthened Greece's hand in that respect. Uh, and so for both Greece and Turkey, a type of Europeanization was actually discernible during the liberal moment. And what used to be a strict bilateral conflict uh, was now enmeshed in the much broader, and of course, a lot more complicated relationship between the European Union and Turkey. And another very significant aspect of that period of time is um, changes in the relationship between Greece and Turkey, which in one sentence become much more complicated than in the past. So, the high politics of a previous era will, of course, remain. Uh, they will not be replaced by anything, not least 
context of uh, no resolution in bilateral conflicts. But what will emerge is a new pattern of trade interaction between the two countries, uh, coming together of civil society actors across the Aegean who will actively work for the improvement of bilateral relations, if only at the level of civil society, and that process will also be sponsored by uh, political leaders on the two sides uh, of the Aegean who will actually see an improvement of Greek-Turkish relations as an asset rather than as a liability. Uh, and I'm thinking here, of course, in particular, of the foreign ministers of the two nations in the late 1990s, uh, George Papandreou in Greece, later to become prime minister during the Eurozone crisis, and Ismail Cem, the then Turkish foreign minister. And so the ability of political leaders to work with uh, business people from both nations, as well as civil society actors and activists, will lead to what is commonly referred to in the literature as earthquake diplomacy, because in 1999, both nations were hit by major earthquakes and the outpouring of solidarity that they mutually showed to each other allowed for a rapid improvement in relations. And of course, the economic element here has come to play a rather significant role, not least because this is a time in which for Greece, Turkey, especially the banking sector of Turkey will provide a fertile ground for important new investment opportunities. And on the part of Turkey, of course, this is also the period following the crisis that the country faced in the early 2000s of rapid economic growth. So during the first decade of the 21st century, Turkey's uh, per capita income will rise uh, exponentially, the country will acquire a much larger middle class and standard theories of what these sort of economic transformations suggest would also imply that the country would now seek to engage in a more uh, peace-oriented relationship with all of its neighbors, including uh, Greece. And while at least this appeared to be the foreign policy orientation of Turkey as well. Now, having said all that, I do not want to suggest that uh, this liberal moment, this uh, idealist, uh, globalist, uh, cosmopolitan moment in international relations was completely uh, unrelated to what had happened before and during the Cold War era. Uh, I already mentioned that we have a large degree of continuity, and I would like to offer a few examples. One of them would be of course, the fact that at the end of the day, and despite talk and also some gestures on the Europeanization of uh, both countries, fundamentally the bilateral dispute over issues regarding state sovereignty, the cornerstone of any state's behavior in the international arena remained intact. So a lot of goodwill, a lot of bilateral agreements on issues like tourism or trade proved maybe inevitably uh, unable to actually push the two political leaderships towards overcoming what was by that time decade old, some would say centuries old, mutual grievances about the behavior of the other side. So in that sense, the, the high politics um, diplomatic overtures proved quite um, fruitless in that sense. Secondly, the role of the United States in the region remained very significant, not least in terms of diffusing um, uh, conflict or the potential of conflict. Uh, prior to the rapprochement between the two sides in the late 1990s, uh, in early 1996, the two states came perilously close to a hot military conflict um, through um, a series of actions and counteractions that led almost to uh, open uh, conflict over the islet of Inia or Kardak in Turkish. And of course, the role of the United States at the time in diffusing the conflict and making sure that the naval forces of the two sides would be withdrawn from the islets 
wars decisive in averting that conflict. So the role of the US as a sponsor and guarantor of a, a, a semblance of stability in that part of the Eastern Mediterranean remain significant. Uh, and finally, uh, and that is one of those elements that we will mention in a minute that differentiates today's um, situation from the one during the liberal moment, the leverage that the West in general and in particular organizations like NATO, the European Union, have over Turkey appear to be quite high. That is to say, Turkey's fundamental foreign policy orienta orientation remains anchored to the West, with membership to the European Union being the most highly prized, if you like, from them all. Turkey, of course, is already a member of pretty much every Western institution out there, NATO, as already mentioned, the OECD, the OSCE, and so it goes. And so for the West being able to draw Turkey through forms of negotiation and cooperation into that um, context remained one of those um, elements that allowed, on the one hand, the Europeanization doctrine or Greek foreign policy to continue, and of course, Turkey itself to remain like anchored to that relationship. Um, which brings me now to the transformation, right? It brings me to the title of today's lecture. I think we have very, very significant changes happening as we speak. And I think that although COVID-19 has been a highly disruptive force and it is very likely that it will lead to even more change going forward, most of the changes that have uh, affected international relations in general and the ways in which Greece and Turkey relate to each other in particular already existed before the pandemic erupted. Now, I think a fundamental one here is what you would call the rise of populist or authoritarian nationalism. And that, of course, is a fusion of a nationalist doctrine that appears to be resurrected uh, from a foregone era, certainly an era before the liberal moment, uh, which doubts uh, the intrinsic value of uh, liberal democracies in delivering prosperity for their people, and which also seeks to utilize deeply populist and authoritarian methods in order to drive forward a particular political agenda. Let us be no doubt, this is an absolutely global movement uh, and it stretch, stretches from the West to the East and it involves all sorts of nations um, in, in the West, and that means to say countries like the United States or the United Kingdom, but it most certainly affects Turkey as well with reference to the way in which the country has been transformed over the last 10 years in particular. Uh, and the, the point I wish to stress in our discussion today is that this is something that has, of course, domestic origins. It is very much related to domestic political constellations in the country. But it is absolutely worth bearing in mind that it actually has foreign policy repercussions. And without getting into more details now, I want to leave this for the Q&A. What I will say is that it is sometimes missed in the discussion about Turkey's foreign policy, and in particular Turkey's foreign policy reorientation, if you like, that the country is in effect run in a coalition in which uh, a nationalist party is actually in office. It's not sharing power formally through the cabinet formation. It actually has as much power as any veto player would have in any democratic system. That is to say, the de facto coalition governing Turkey today is actually underpinned by deeply nationalist assumptions about both the confidence that the country should be projecting abroad, but also the way in which domestic policy should be run. So the way in which Turkey has changed is dramatic, uh, both domestically and in terms of its foreign policy orientation. Let me give an example about foreign policy. The idea that Turkey's the all foreign policy goal is EU membership is by now certainly a thing of the past. And uh, one could discuss probably at length what are the precise reasons for that. 
um, sometimes people who engage in that type of analysis uh, are actually eager to also play the blame game in terms of whether it was Turkey that decided to uh, leave the table first or whether it was the EU that pushed Turkey out. Be it as it may, what is certain is that Turkey now sees itself as playing a different role um, in the region and beyond. The catalyst for the process was the Arab Spring, what quickly emerged to be the Arab Winter, uh, but which appeared to be the Arab Spring for a time and which allowed Turkish foreign policymakers to conceive of the role of Turkey as much bigger in general uh, and much more influential in the region in particular, turning Turkey into a massively significant regional player, a regional actor that could determine outcomes in the wider MENA region in the Middle East, as well as in North Africa. And of course, what this has meant is that, on the one hand, the country's role in NATO has come into um, doubt. This is related to its, to its cultivation of uh, upgraded relations with Russia, uh, a relationship which, of course, is fraught with difficulty, but which appears to be surviving what often appears to be the antithesis of foreign policy priorities between the two nations, not least in countries such as Syria and, as of late, Libya as well. In terms of the EU vocation of Turkey, this is a thing of the past, or it certainly appears to be at the moment. And for as long as the political balance of power in Ankara is as is, it is more than likely that the continuation of Turkey's EU vocation will be of course, there is also the uh, Islamic world to which Turkey, with a new assertive set of self-confidence policies and policy measures, has sought to exercise leadership. In other words, Turkey, among the two countries, is the one that has been absolutely transformed as a result of developments during the last decade. Now, what about Greece? Greece has gone, obviously, through a massively painful process of uh, economic contraction. This has had dramatic uh, political consequences, the transformation of party politics being the best example, the rise of populism with hinges of authoritarianism being a second one. But overall, the country's uh, approach, and at least its foreign policy orientation, has remained anchored to what it used to be in the past, namely its orientation towards the Western alliances. Greece has sought to expand its uh, circle of friends, if you wish to uh, use the term in the Eastern Mediterranean, the partnership with countries like Israel being the best example. Now, the consequence of this is that um, we now have a relationship transformed as a result of the two countries fundamentally being out of sync with one another. What I mean to say by this is, Turkey is now projecting an image of itself through which bilateral relations with Greece and the movement, or even the freezing of the existing conflicts with Greece, appear to be of a lesser concern. Turkey seeks to project the image of a country that actually plays big and does so in a number of countries by sending troops um, in other countries by actively intervening to prop up particular types of regimes, by seeking to uh, exercise the role of a country that is very much in line with the new wave of power politics dominated international relations. And of course, for a country like Greece, this reorientation of Turkey, part of the global context, makes its own approach towards Turkey, friend and foe in turn, actually quite a complicated story. The fundamental reason behind this is, if we're going to live, to relive in an era of power politics, for a country like Greece, it becomes very difficult to replace the Europeanization of Turkey approach with something, with something else, through which you will be able to be comfortable. That is to say, it appeals towards international law. It appeals towards the significance of rule of law and good neighborly relations. 
as setting the context within which it wishes to live with Turkey, often become problematic, not in the sense that Turkey does not rhetorically share the same values, but because in practice they cannot be exercised at the time when the global context has shifted away from the kind of value-driven liberal orientation towards the upholding of the rule of law. One good example is the last point you can see on the slide and relates to the role of the United States. Now, domestically, the United States is a country that is also undergoing some massively uh, important changes, uh, the outcome of which we have open. What is absolutely certain is that the foreign policy orientation of the United States, and I do not believe that this is something which begins with the Trump presidency, but extends further back into the past, is actually changing too. And although there are going to be differences in tone, and there are going to be differences in the sort of emphasis that different administrations will play, I think that it's almost inevitable that the role of the United States uh, in relation to what it used to do in the past in this region is weaker today and will be weaker in the future as well. And if you take that in the context of the rise of authoritarian political practices, if you take that in the context of a situation in which the old multilateral rules-based and order-based structures of international politics are weakened, the absence of uh, role of the United States as the ultimate guarantor of some form of um, frozen conflicts between Greece and Turkey acquires a new significance. The role of possible US mediation, should it come to a form of skirmish between the two sides, is today uncertain, uh, to say the least. And in all of this, the global and the national, we also have the regional. Of course, it's great that we are talking in the context of an institute which is, of course, devoting its research output in the Eastern Mediterranean, precisely because the transformation of Greek-Turkish relations also goes through a change in the regional context. Uh, hydrocarbon explorations, from the moment they appeared on the radar of major players in the region and others further beyond, such as Italy, France, the United States, or Russia, meant that both new opportunities and the potential for new conflict emerged. Now, we now have a series of countries which are creating types of alliances with one another. And these sort of alliances, and I think that's an important point to stress, tend to be characterized by their short-termism, by the tactical rather than strategic nature of what they seek to do in the region. And they also tend to be very much animated by actions, acts, or counteractions that other players in the region are willing to undertake. One very obvious and very timely example, of course, is Libya. Um, and what is happening in the country, following, of course, the ousting of Muammar Gaddafi, in 2011, following the, the prolongation of a civil conflict, which has now, which now appears to be crystallized into some form of an internationally recognized government on the one hand, backed by countries like Turkey, and at least partially Italy as well, and on the other hand, attempts to create alternative administrations outside of Tripoli, backed by countries such as Egypt or Greece, creates a context in which both Greece and Turkey are now pulled into a new set of relationships which, and I think that's significant, they do not necessarily control. So what we are seeing in the region is deeply problematic in the sense that it appears to be reminiscent of developments happening approximately 100, 100 years ago. That is to say, countries entering into a very unstable vortex seeking to make short-term gains over one another in the name of not being excluded from the possibility of the riches that uh, hydrocarbons explorations promise and may end up um, being undermined as a result. Now, again, Turkey is very significant here 
the activism that the country uh, displays, not least in propping up uh, the regime in Tripoli. Uh, recently, we had um, a delegation from Turkey visiting the country uh, and engaging in uh, bilateral talks, suggests that Turkey is now absolutely determined to play a very important role. Now, the reason why this can potentially spell disaster is because Libya is of strategic significance for countries like Egypt, which it is directly linked. It is very significant for the maintenance of stability in the region in which countries like Russia, like France, like the United States, have an open stage. And all of this is happening at a time when Greek-Turkish relations have deteriorated, I would argue, probably to the lowest point since the 1990s, that is to say, since the liberal moment emerged uh, at the latter end of that decade. Um, the big question that emerges as a result is whether countries like Greece and Turkey can actually turn this sort of constellation into a win-win scenario rather than end up with a zero-sum game. Zero -sum game. Um, at the end of the day, when everything has been said and done, I believe that the transformation of Greek-Turkish relations now holds the potential of further instability because the approach of the two countries, at least at a discursive level with regard to their foreign policy preferences in the region, stem from opposite normative foundations. That is to say, Greece seeks to project itself as an upholder of peace and stability in the region with reference to international legality and the consequences that are derived from international legally binding agreements and arrangements. The best example would be the United Nations Convention on the Northern of the Seas. With Turkey, on the other hand, although not, of course, rejecting this kind of normative position, feeling increasingly comfortable with the return of power politics, that is to say, hard politics in the region, having made and continuing to make very significant investments in propping up the current uh, government in Libya, playing an absolutely protagonistic role in Syria and seeking to extend its influence further beyond. This context, the regional and global context, means that what used to be a bilateral conflict is no longer the case. And that therefore means that we find ourselves in a transformative phase, the way in which changes have been um, taking place in the two countries, and especially Turkey, over the last decade, means that we are dealing with a country fundamentally transformed in relation to us. Please pay attention to the fact that Turkey is not the only country that has undergone this transformation. Off the top of my head, countries like India or Israel probably also fall into the same category. But the consequences in terms of how their foreign policy is going to be um, assessed and measured from now on are, I think, quite dramatic. Externally, and apart from the domestic transformation of Turkey that spills over to its foreign policy approach, the role of both the United States and the European Union has changed as a result as well. And if all of this was not uh, enough, if you wish, the way in which uh, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, realpolitik scenario currently being played out adds a new and very complicated layer on a relationship which is already very much fraught with difficulties, a relationship which is conditioned by antithetical positions on a whole number of issues and at a time when the channels of bilateral communication, instead of multiplying, appear to be becoming uh, less and less significant in seeking to diffuse the possibility of conflict between the two nations. I will leave by just reminding you of how just days before the outbreak of the new coronavirus pandemic in our part of the world, in the Eastern Mediterranean, Greece and Turkey, in effect, faced off each other on their mainland border as a result of an attempt to bring in 
thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of either migrants or refugees who were on Turkish territory and sought to make the transition to Europe via Greece. Um, and I'm afraid that this sort of um, tension between the two countries, at least given their current positions, is very likely um, to continue uh, in the future. So I will, I will stop here and uh, I will be more than happy to uh, answer questions as they come up. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Saruhas. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we do have that Q&A that you can drop those um, questions in. So feel free to ask any that are on your mind. Um, you can use that little chat down there. So thanks again. I guess um, to sort of give like a follow-up comment, um, I found it very interesting when you mentioned that Turkey and Greece have these two different normative structures going on. Greece wants to almost uphold this sort of liberal identity and that works for Greece. But if Turkey is sort of going on this zero sum path and abides by those rules, it's a threat to Greece. And you briefly mentioned UNCLOS, but I think that's a very, very important part because I think for Turkey um, to sort of concede to this international law to have that, you know, the 12 nautical miles of having that control would be extremely detrimental to Turkey. It would be handicap it considerably. So, I mean, if you could just further elaborate, I think that's a very important part because, you know, if that international law is respected, you know, the Aegean almost becomes a Greek lake. Um, Turkey is very much blocked out. So I would be interested to hear more of your comments on that and how that affects this dynamic. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dylan, for the question. I think it's an excellent question, at least because I, I decided not to get into the nitty-gritty details of bilateral conflict, but rather contextualize where the two nations stand today. I think you're absolutely right that um, there are issues with respect to international law that most certainly divide the two nations because it very often comes to how you interpret uh, particular clauses and the way in which you wish them to be interpreted. And in particular, when it comes to um, the delineation of sea borders, which is what you are alluding to, there is very little doubt that Greece extending its um, sea borders to 12 nautical miles would in indeed turn the Aegean into a Greek lake, which is precisely the reason as to why it has not happened. I think the biggest issue, uh, given that the, the agenda set by the two sides is at least with reference to issues like this, pretty much given. The real issue is not so much the technicalities. That is to say, so-called confidence building measures between the two nations, successive rounds of negotiations over the technicalities have taken place in the past, and they're very likely to continue happening in the future. I think what is really missing here is the political determination to agree on, on the agenda itself, there is a dispute as we speak as to what it is precisely that the two countries ought to agree on, either through bilateral negotiations or through international mediation. And it's fundamentally the political willingness to actually engage seriously in those negotiations that would allow issues like the sea borders to be resolved. And of course, a very recent example, if I may, very quickly, uh, is the a delineation of the exclusive economic zones that Greece and Italy have recently agreed to. Now, if you want my opinion, what you could have here in very different circumstances in a different context, would at least potentially be a template of how the two countries would be able, would be able to resolve their own bilateral differences with respect to the delineation of sovereign rights on the sea and the determination of an exclusive economic zone. And talking about international law, I think you're right. International law is, cannot be the be-all of international relations and international politics. International law is meant to be an instrument. It's meant to be a facilitating factor that will allow good-natured states that wish to have stable and peaceful bilateral relations to resolve their conflict. In the absence of that will, there is very little, I'm afraid, the international law can do to prove a decisive factor. Thank you. I believe we have a question in the chat. 
Um, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing this right, but it's Dmitriak um, Chachka. And I believe they're asking, is it possible that the state of relations between Turkey and Greece affect the relations between Greece and Albania, considering that these two countries are not willing anymore to continue talking about their sea borders? Um, I think that yeah. Many thanks for the question. I think the format of regional cooperation is currently changing. Um, countries like Albania have an important role to play, at least because obviously it is a direct neighbor to Greece. Uh, but it does have, and as time has gone on, it has also been cultivating strong and active relations with uh, the Turkish government as well. Uh, probably what would be the best scenario here would be an attempt in which all three countries would come together in different types of, if you like, asymmetric cooperation, because they have different issues, different outstanding issues with one another, but all within the context of actually wishing to resolve their um, conflict. And so I think all sorts of neighboring countries, be it Albania, be it uh, Italy, as we saw recently with the agreement between Greece and Italy, uh, North Macedonia, whatnot, They're, they are all countries that potentially, that's what I've tried to stress in the lecture, could play a constructive role bilaterally with Greece or Turkey, or indeed with both. Uh, but that's very much a matter of political play. All right, thank you. Um, another question I would like to ask to, um, you mentioned something about sort of this reduced um, ability of the United States or this perception of somewhat of a withdrawal of the United States from the region as far as mediating the conflict between the two nations. Um, to what degree is that like the reality? So I'm an alumni of the program that we did in Crete. And I remember going to the base there in Suda Bay and, you know, the American military seemed ready, prepared. It did not seem like there was any sort of retreat going on. So I know it's become very popular to say the United States is retreating, but in other ways, I feel like I do see engagement still. And, you know, I don't believe U.S.-Greco relationships have fallen off in recent years. I think they're still as strong as ever. So uh, I would like your thoughts more on that, so just to sort of comment on the extremity of how bad this sort of retreat of the Americans in the region really is? Thank you for the question. I think it's, it's a great question, which allows me to clarify my thoughts on the subject. That is to say the bilateral relationship between the US and Greece probably has never had as much of a heyday as it does today. And I, I sincerely believe and hope that this is to the benefit of both peoples. Greece does indeed cultivate, and I think so do the United States, uh, a relationship based on mutual trust. And I have absolutely no doubt that the commitment of the US in Greece in all types of relations and sectors remains there. Please get, do not get me wrong. I was not to suggest for a second that the US is withdrawing from Greece in any literal or metaphorical sense. What I actually meant to suggest was that the US foreign policy priorities are shifting rapidly away from this region in, in general, and that the relationship between uh, the United States and Turkey, a relationship fraught with complications and difficulties, is um, very different from the one that they have with Greece. My assumption is that the United States potentially may play less of a role should it come to an actual dispute. And of course, uh, it will very much matter also what type of a dispute that, it's, that is going to be. The bilateral relationship between Greece and the United States remains fundamentally solid, uh, but the, the role of mediation, the role of arbitration that the U.S. has traditionally played in the region is likely to get reduced in the future. Thank you for answering my question. Um, we do actually have a few in the Q&A, so let me just look at those. All right. So we have... Um, Liviu Mihail um, Ayanku, it is known that Turkey is heavily involved in the Libyan conflict, even though sending significant military aid and fighters. 
A less known behavior is that of Greece. What is Greece doing to counteract Turkey's growing influence in Libya, except diplomacy, example, giving tactical alliances with actors opposed to the GNA, the party supported by Turkey? Right. I think that what is, um, that's a very good question. What is Greece doing? One, one, uh, one could probably pose the question of, as what could Greece do? Or indeed, what should Greece do? And I think that there is far from a clear answer on this. As the uh, uh, person posing the question very rightly suggests, Greece does offer and has offered forms of diplomatic support to the GNA opponents uh, in the country uh, of Haftar and has sought in that sense to build a broader diplomatic alliance with nations like France in particular, who share the same sentiment. Now, Turkey is suggesting the role of the United States is going to be much more aligned to its own interests, but Greece sees itself as part of a very different alliance, one that is shaped by countries such as Egypt, which of course is opposed to the uh, consolidation of the Sarraj government uh, throughout the territory of, of Libya, because of the consequences that this could have for internal political stability in Egypt and for the al Sisi region as well. Now, one important thing to point here, and which I did not mention, uh, I didn't have the time to mention during the lecture, is how the international community as a whole, ostensibly Turkey included, agrees on the idea that weapons need to be silenced in Libya and a form of ceasefire needs to be imposed. And of course, NATO has sought to play a role there by sending frigates in the region, France sending one recently, and almost ending up in what the French alleged to be um, hostile behavior on the part of Turkey in the coastal waters just outside the Libyan regime, so the Libyan territory. So what is happening right now is a situation in which Turkey plays an extremely active role, sometimes suggesting the willingness of sending of playing a constructive role in terms of imposing uh, the ceasefire. NATO, to which it's included, ostensibly agrees to the idea of an arms embargo in Libya to make sure that the country will not fall once again into open conflict. But in practice, this doesn't seem to be happening at all. And as we speak, NATO is meant to be investigating and mediating exactly what happened last week between Turkey and France off the coast of Libya. And of course, a country like Greece, with much more uh, limited uh, resources in the region, is part of the wider powers which are seeking to maintain the arms embargo. Greece has sent a frigate in the region. Uh, it seems to be outnumbered. It is uh, too small. It's not particularly powerful. It is there. And uh, I think it is only through diplomatic and political means that the current conflict in Libya could potentially be over. All right. I have a question from Adrian. Considering the fact that parts of Romania were included in the former Ottoman Empire, and nowadays Turkey is following the Neo-Ottomanism theory, how does Turkey see all of its former territories in Romania, Bulgaria? Does it want to expand its sphere of influence again? It's an interesting point because the, the Neo-Ottomanism um, theorem, of course, have, is open to, I think, a multitude of different interpretations. And, uh, and one, one interpretation, of course, is that you know, expanding this sphere of influence will actually materialize in potentially destabilizing forms of behavior. Now, my own assumption, naive as it may be, is that in particular in the former, you know, in the Balkan uh, territories of the former Ottoman Empire, Turkey has invested heavily in forms of soft power credentials. And so the best example probably is not countries like Bulgaria or Romania, but it's most certainly the former Yugoslavia, in which during particularly the foreign ministry um, period of the former prime minister and foreign minister, Ahmed Davutoglu, who has now split from the uh, AKP party and has created his own political party. During that time, uh, Turkey played a very active role in seeking to mediate between um, differing sides. And I, I'm suspecting, I'm far from an expert in this particular region that um, we have been asked about, I have the impression that Turkey there 
will probably try to continue cultivating good and stable diplomatic relations. It will seek to emphasize its former presence in the region, and it will continue the policy of the last 15 to 20 years, which is a continued active economic presence, as well as political presence. The extent to which Turkey's economic difficulties, to put it mildly, will allow it to continue exercising that sort of role, one could call it neo-Ottoman, is far from certain. I, I, I beg to suggest that Turkey's forthcoming economic woes are likely to lead to more instability, domestically speaking, rather than an ability to play an active role in parts of its former Ottoman bands in that part of Europe. All right, thank you. Um, again, feel free to add any questions into the Q&A box. Um, kind of going off of on a similar vein about um, Turkey's sort of soft power, but a little bit of hard power mixed in there too. Um, in recent years, they have been sort of expanding and sort of getting a foothold in two very strategic places that are sort of on the doorstep of the Eastern Mediterranean. One, they're entrenching themselves in the Horn of Africa, if I recall, both with soft power diplomacy by establishing a military presence there and also in the Persian Gulf as well. So that's a very interesting dynamic on its own with the region, with all those other major players like Iran and Saudi Arabia. But how do you think this will translate into the Eastern Mediterranean? How could this be problematic for Greece, considering that that is the next sort of stop? If we look at the global supply chain, after that, you're into the Suez, and now you're into that sort of backyard, so to speak. So what are your thoughts on that development and how that sort of influences this sort of bilateral relationship? That's a great question, uh, Dylan. I think it will very much depend on the extent to which Turkey will be able to pull off some of its strategic objectives, both in the Horn and in the Persian Gulf. The danger that Turkey faces right now is the overstretching. Um, it projects a notion of confidence, occasionally backed by material presence in far-fetched parts of the world, which have never really aligned with Turkey's immediate foreign policy objectives. Uh, in the old days during the Cold War, we used to talk about a form of imperial overstretch on the part of the Soviet Union. I don't mean to suggest that the USSR and Turkey are similar in any shape or form, but I can see similar problems emerging for Turkey when it decides to be active in far-fetched parts of the world in which it doesn't necessarily have the expertise and indeed the commitment to remain in the region once its immediate objectives have been fulfilled. Now, to address your question directly on the part of Greece, I think this is more about uh, shedding a watchful eye over the successes and failures of Turkey's foreign policy in the region and the extent to which they will uh, lead to some form of reshaping of its own approach towards Greece. Personally, I don't think that those kind of endeavors on the part of Turkey there will have a direct bearing on its bilateral relationship with Greece. And that's precisely the reason as to why, as I suggested in the lecture, for Greece, the default position is to contextualize its relations with Turkey on the Western Front and to suggest or indeed to encourage and ask for a much more active presence on the part of its European allies rather than seeking to engage with Turkey strictly bilaterally. Thank you. Um, once more, um, feel free to ask any questions. If not, we can wrap up in a little bit. Um, I guess to continue on with another question, um, and this is more of like an open-ended thing, considering the coronavirus has been so sudden and has certainly incapacitated multiple states and has sort of dragged them into this sort of internal instability, um, kind of going to the United States again as it's distracted over here with its own coronavirus response, do you see like within this crisis, maybe the role of a future mediator coming in? Is there any other like major power that has interest into sort of making sure that there's sort of this 
Greco-Turkish stability and sort of calming these bilateral relationships. So, uh, Let me begin uh, by saying that it's actually not um, very encouraging that these two nations, at least with regard to their bilateral conflict, would still need an external sponsor to make sure that they will not end up with open skirmish. I think that's actually quite sad in terms of the way in which their relations have evolved, particularly considering the liberal moment that I talked about during the lecture. So, so much by way of context. Uh, again, with respect to the direct content of your question, there appeared to be a moment in which um, seeking to, to find a sort of country that could exercise that role, France appeared to be well equipped to do so because of its overall regional presence, uh, its very warm relations with Greece, uh, and therefore the potential of actually playing a role. It is now quite clear, at least following the events of the last few days, that the bilateral relationship between France and Turkey has deteriorated to an extent that would not allow for this to happen. It now appears, again, following very recent events, this is a very dynamic situation, that maybe Italy could exercise some role there, notwithstanding its own very significant uh, domestic weaknesses and, to be frank, very different priorities as well. Uh, I mention Italy not least because of the recent agreement, Greece and Italy on the one hand, and the rather welcoming remarks that the Turkish foreign minister had for that agreement when hosting his Italian counterparts in Ankara last week. However, I don't think that this uh, actually carries a lot of uh, potential, and personally, I would argue that the one country save, of course, for the United States, if we assume that the US, for one reason or another, would not play the active role of the past, the one country that actually could do so from a quite a credible point of view would be Germany. And that's because, of course, relations between Germany and Greece are very good, at least in the context of both the EU and NATO. But of course, Germany and Turkey also have a rather special relationship uh, that extends to the cultural sphere, forms of political cooperation, and of course, the very large Turkish diaspora uh, in Germany itself. The problem there is quite clearly that Germany is uh, rather unwilling to exercise a more, if you wish, heavyweight diplomatic role. Uh, it continues to be the economic giant of Europe, large in determining economic outcomes for the future of European integration. It is rather unwilling to translate its economic might, at least in the pre-coronavirus era, into a diplomatic presence as well. And therefore, the short answer, I suppose, the short version to your question is that Apart from the United States, for better or worse, there seems to be very little prospect of other nations being able to come in, should it come, hopefully not, to an open conflict. Thank you. We actually had two questions pop up. Um, another one from Liviu Mihail um, Ayanku. You have just talked about other countries. What is the interest of Russia with regards to the Turkish-Greek relations? How could it influence these relations? That's a great question. And it allows me to say just a few words about Russia. It sometimes puzzles, particularly uh, Turkey experts, as to how this relationship, which appears to be on the brink of collapse, I'm referring to the Russia-Turkey relationship, uh, when Turkey shot down a Russian air jet, has improved to the extent that despite the fact that at least based on their own statements and pronouncements. The two countries seem not to be able to see eye to eye on pretty much anything in the MENA region. They still uh, retain a very close pattern of diplomatic alignment. Now, when it comes to the Greek-Turkish relationship, I think there is little at stake for Russia. Russia has had traditionally good relations with Greece. I think it is in the interest of both Russia and Turkey to work together. Uh, not least in certain parts of the world in which they both seek to exercise um, a large amount. And Syria, of course, has been the best theatre, if you want, the, the, the prime example of how the involvement of Russia has actually altered the balance of power on the ground and has allowed, in this particular case, the Assad regime to survive uh, the assault 
policed by ISIS and others in the country. So Russia wants to maintain a relationship with Turkey, despite the fact that there are important disagreements. It will not spend a large amount of diplomatic capital in seeking to arbitrate between the two, but probably will be in a position to offer good services to both states, despite the fact that Greece's foreign policy orientation is without a shadow of a doubt, and I think rightly, uh, oriented towards the Western alliance, which means that by default, Russia's ability to influence outcomes on the ground will actually be quite limited. All right. So now we have a question from Dr. Elizabeth Prodromu. If there is a hot incident this summer around Crete, given Turkey's stated intentions to violate Greece's maritime sovereignty by beginning natural gas exploration to the south of Crete, how might NATO respond? If Greece invokes Article 5, would NATO respond? Understanding that Article 5 was written with the intention of protection against an external threat, but with no prohibition on invocation in the case of an internal threat. How active is diplomacy between Greece and Turkey to prevent such a po very possible scenario? That's a great question by Elizabeth. Uh, first things first, probably the explorations that Turkey has actually pre-announced. Uh, you could not accuse Turkey of inconsistency in that respect. They are there uh, talking about the explorations in the open, and this tends to, tends to follow with actual deeds is not going to happen during the summer. I think the sort of calendar we have ahead of us talks about early fall, probably October. Uh, we'll see, but I don't think this is going to happen in the summer. There's meant to be a moratorium between the two stage, uh, states during the summer season anyways, on other issues as well, uh, and at least the dog fights. These don't seem to be uh, applicable this year because of the coronavirus. So probably skirmishes between the two sides will also fall victim to the virus too. Uh, but I think the, the actual calendar, so to speak, that Turkey is a bit ostensibly talking about, is a bit further down the line. But to the substance of the question, uh, Tur Greece is not going to evoke Article 5 because uh, both Greece and Turkey are NATO members. It would be rather uh, futile to do so. What Greece will call for is solidarity on the part of other NATO allies. I think very much will depend on the context and the actual outplay of events. It is more than likely that countries such as France uh, will position themselves quite clearly. If something is going to happen, it's probably going to happen before the November elections in the United States for obvious reasons. Uh, and that will automatically probably mean that the ability of NATO to actually directly intervene would be smaller than if some kind of an event was to happen following the November election, which is a big assumption uh, that there is going to be a change in administration. So I, I'm not quite sure as to whether NATO will be able to play a very significant role. It will try to do so behind the scenes, that is more than certain. What I don't know is whether that would be enough to actually diffuse the tension if indeed we end up with what appears to me to be the worst case scenario, which is an actual explicit violation on the part of Turkey of what Greece considers to be its own sea borders, rather than, which would be the more mild scenario, of a different interpretation as to what constitutes sovereign rights in a, in a region that would not be directly adjusted to Greece but rather further afield. All right, thank you so, so much, Dr. Sarujas. This has been a wonderful talk, a wonderful lecture. We all learned a great deal. We appreciate you coming and um, speaking to us at the Institute. Um, we really appreciate your time this afternoon um, and for taking time out of your night over there in Turkey. So thank you all for coming out to this lecture. Um, we will be continuing these conversations as the week progresses. Um, tomorrow we will be having, I have the little list over here of the lectures. So tomorrow we'll be having Dr. Aref Abelid talking about democratization in the Arab world at 10 o'clock in the morning. And then later at two, we'll be having Dr. Constantine
Adamides um, about the Cyprus in the sub-regional security complex of the Eastern Mediterranean. So thank you all so, so very much. Dr. Suruhas, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Dylan. And thank you to everyone for taking the time. Thank you. We appreciate having you. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and a good evening as well. <laughs>